and sometimes uh, looking at the world through a sardine means something. <laughs> I like this though now. Who knows why? why? So the blizzard's coming, the blizzard's coming. The Russians are coming, the blizzard's coming. My mother shoveled snow 50 years ago. Now it's global warming. They'll probably preempt me on the East Coast to tell you that a snowman is going to do the news for you. What can you write about a snowstorm? Well, I guess which roads are closed and what this. People go down with the heart attacks from a shovel job. I never understood that when I was a kid. You shovel snow and die of a heart attack. How did that even happen? That's so strenuous, throwing a few loads of snow. Who knows? Whatever. Cold weather and shoveling from heart attack. Perfect storm. By the way, in the next hour, I don't have the time right now, I have something very surprising for you. Take a guess who the oldest man in the world is. He's 112 years old. I'll give you a hint. And last week, a man 112 died in Japan called Yasutaro Koidi. He was 112 and he died. So now they found someone else, a man now who's 112. There's a woman somewhere who's 116. Okay, women outlive men generally. And the man is not Japanese, and I'll tell you what he lived through in his life. No one listening to this show has lived through anything as bad as what he lived through, and he's 112. And you know what the motto of the story is? You can live through things. Stop crying about how bad America is and how bad Obama is and how there's never been a worse and you're going to die if it keeps up. You have no idea what people have lived through, are living through, and can live through. You have no idea. And if it's anything I can give my audience that's different, it's inspiration. I want to give you another inspirational today. No matter what's happened to you, it's nothing compared to what's hap what happened to this man in his life. And he lived to 112. He's still living. And you got to listen to his philosophy. I can't get him as a guest, but I have a little write-up on him. You won't believe the, how interesting this is. It gives you such hope that you don't walk around like a victim, and I can't do it, and I can't take it, and this is no good, and I can't make it, and I can't live, and this happened, and Molly then. WMAL, Perry, welcome. What's on your mind? What's the topic? You know, um, after watching Trump, you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I might be leaning towards this guy. I might. Why, why, why as a Democrat would you lean towards Trump? I'm very curious for me. Well, I mean, and and it's based on and watching him. He comes as his own man. He like like Ms. Fa, like Ms. Farrakhan said. He's not a political whore. He comes with his own money. He, so he's not emboldened to no one except. Well, here's the thing, Perry. You've called the show before, and you are a member of the Nation of Islam, but your leader. Farrakhan doesn't like Trump very much. He gave a very stern warning against Trump two weeks ago. You'd be surprised what he said in an interview with Alex Jones yesterday. Um, he had some very favorable things that he didn't endorse him. I'm not going to say that. But he had some favorable things to say. Where, I, who, who, Louis Farrakhan did? Yes, listen to the interview. Alex All right, well, I know, I know why. I thought about it. I noticed that as inflammatory as he normally is, spewing hate day and night. I didn't know why he was so soft-peddling Trump. It's because Louis Farrakhan is a very wise politician. And he knows that the political winds have changed in America. And he knows that if he keeps this up and Trump becomes president, he's liable to wind up in prison for hate speech. And so what he's doing now is moving in a, into the middle direction to protect his back. He's very smart. I mean, he didn't get where he is by being unsmart. Get it? So I understand that. And I like Alex. He invited me back on his show again. I think I'll do it soon. I just haven't been able to do it. I don't have the time. Well, thank you, my friend Perry. That brings us to the end of our number one of Government Zero's home base. In the next hour, the oldest man on earth. What's a liberal? What's a conservative? What's you? Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised.
And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. I believe in private enterprise. I believe in you know, the, the incredible dynamism of the American economy, and that's business. Oh, sure. And we're, you know, right. America's business sure is business. We, we love business. Oh, yeah. But mm. after two years of corporate mm. profits, we also have to make sure that business is sharing what it makes with the workers who make it. Yee-ha! Yee-ha! So now he wants profit sharing in corporations. Hmm. Ten million dollars in vacation, eighty million dollars spent on vacation, seventy to personal aids for the wife. Where's the money gonna come from? And you know look, the fact is, let's be clear. The day Microsoft, Google, Facebook pay their fair share of taxes will be a great day for America. I mean, don't assume I'm sitting here like some big fat cat who, who wants lower taxes for all. I pay through the nose and I'm sick of it. But just imagine the day you wake up that that uh, undershirt wearing creep from Facebook has to pay a full share of taxes for Facebook. Just imagine what kind of money that would be. They don't pay full taxes. They don't. But you don't care about that. I don't know what you care about. I told you in this hour I would tell you who the oldest living man is. He's 112, where he lives. I told you we'd get into the Clinton emails are so secret that some lawmakers are not allowed to read them. I told you we'd talk about the history of progressivism. I told you Jane Fonda and a group of Hollywood lunatic leftists have attacked Trump, joined by those who consider themselves to be conservative, and they don't even understand the irony of that one. But I didn't get to these topics, which I pulled for the day, and I may or may not get to. The FBI ran a website sharing thousands of child porn images. This is shocking. For nearly two weeks last year, the FBI operated what it described as one of the Internet's largest child pornography websites, allowing users to download thousands of illicit images and videos from a government site in the Washington suburbs. Now, how this came about was the FBI seized a child pornography website and then they left it online in an attempt to catch users who officials said would otherwise remain hidden behind an encrypted and anonymous computer network. It's an amazing story in USA Today that you have to read. This site, known as Playpen, which was operated by the Justice Department, had more than 215,000 registered sickos and included links to more than 23,000 sexually explicit images and videos of children, including more than 9,000 files that keep people could download. Now, the next sentence is so disgusting, I'm going to read it to you because you have to know what kind of fiends and ghouls live in this country. Some of the images described in court filings involve children barely old enough for kindergarten having sex with adults. Uh, I feed them to the pigs and run it on a pay-per-view. Any adult who's convicted of such crimes... You throw them into a pig pen in Sardinia, and you run it up on the, on a bird. You charge an Internet fee, and you give it to the victims of uh, child pornography. You watch them being eaten alive. That would stop the child porno thing, wouldn't it? I read that by last year, the FBI said Playpen had grown to become, quote, the largest remaining known child porno hidden service in the world. The FBI tracked the site to computer servers in North Carolina and in February seized the site and quietly moved it to its own facility in N Newington, Virginia. And the FBI then kept the child porno website open for 13 days. And during that time, federal prosecutors told defense lawyers that the site included more than 23,000 sexually explicit images and videos of children. So I don't want to read any more of the details of it. But I read something in here that caught my eye as well. Listen to this one. Federal agents first noticed that Playpen was open after it went online in August of 2014, okay? The website, the child porno website, was buried in what is often called the dark web, a part of the Internet that is accessible to the public only through Tor, network software that bounces users' Internet traffic from one computer to another to make it largely untraceable. 
I wonder if Hillary used Tor to, uh, could she have, could Hillary have used Tor, <laughs> Robert? I'm asking you, that's what caught my eye. It's, it's, a, um, it's a network software that bounces users into that traffic from one computer to another to make it largely untraceable. Maybe uh, they use Tor up there in, in Quinnipiac, uh, in, in wherever she lives, Quinnipiac, Scarsdale, in that area. Some it's a blur to me. It's a giant area that I, in Westchester that she lives in. I don't know what she had. Uh, let's see. So there's nothing you can say about this. You know, there's no, what, what can you say about child pornography? Does anyone support it? Of course not. In each case, the FBI injected the site with malware to crack Tor's anonymity. Those hacks developed with the help of outside contractors were a technical milestone. I like that. When the FBI realized it could break through Tor, Hosko said the agency gathered counterterrorism investigators and intelligence agencies to see if any of them had a more pressing need for the software. It was this exponentially. This is amazing. Uh, this amazing story here. It actually gives me faith in the FBI, to be honest with you. I have great faith in the FBI. I really do. Pressure mounts on Clinton as she lashes out at intelligence community over email probe. So she's attacking not only the FBI, she's also attacking the attorney, the, I'm sorry, the inspector general. How could anyone vote for her? How could anyone vote for her? I don't understand this. Then I saw another article on the Washington Post, which I had to, I had to bring up. The Obama is a Muslim conspiracy theory is still reverberating in the Middle East. Not in the Middle West. Not in the Midwest. In the Middle East, it's a big theory that he's a Muslim. They say, listen to this, it goes like this. Are you ready for this? This is shocking. One of the most persistent and widespread of these conspiracy theories gets more specific than its American variant. The theory says Obama isn't just a Muslim. He's a Shiite Muslim. And this week, as the Obama administration announced that it was lifting sanctions on Iran as a result of the so-called nuclear deal with Tehran, Dahai Kalfan Tamim, the head of general security for the Emirate of Dubai, suggested that Obama's Shiite roots, unquote, had helped him get elected in a bid to bring the United States and Iran closer. Mission accomplished, he added. This is happening in the Middle East, that he's really a Shiite. And he was put in power by Iran in order to get the sanctions listed, lifted. This is an amazing story. This is, and by the way, it, it, it's noted that this man is not an obscure figure. He is a former police chief of Dubai. His Twitter account has more than 1.2 million followers. And his tweets about Obama were retweeted hundreds of times. And so he has put out a rumor that Obama is a Shiite who was elected uh, on Iran's behalf. Pretty amazing. Just shows you what you can find if you study hard enough. And this is all I do for a living, is this. I do nothing else. I have no outside business inter interests. I write books one a year. Maybe sometimes the dog book will come out this year and the journals. But they're a product of many years of work. It's all I do. And this is what I do. I, all morning, all night, I'm obsessed with the news and I'm obsessed with as a former scholar who can dig for uh, um, information, get to the sources, I dig and I dig and I dig and I dig. I don't just read the headlines. And then I come on the air and I have to now condense it for you into a way that it's packaged so that you'll listen to me. So I open with the world through a sardine. And I actually thought about that today. <clears throat> Should I tell them about the sardine story with the fishermen? How does that really relate to the bigger picture? Will they understand the metaphor? And I, I didn't know the answer to it. All I said to myself was, I'm just filling you in on where my head's going right now. All I, all I said to myself was, you know what? The audience expects a unique show for me every day. They don't want the same old thing. They don't want Dem Repub, Cruz Trump, Cruz Trump, Cruz Trump, Cruz Trump. And they, they got to get, you got to come at it from another point of view because that's what you specialize in. You specialize in the unique. Otherwise, you're like, you heard it already a thousand times. Now, what's next? Right? What's next? So I said, they expect me to start with something different from Life 101. And it's real. I talked to the sardine fishermen. I found out the fish are flash frozen and sold and shipped to J Japan. We don't even get a fin. We don't even get a scale out of the sardines from our own waters. You hear this? They don't even, the Japanese don't even leave us a scale. Not a fin. 
If I had the power, that would stop. My natural resources do not.